You're listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author Sarah Box, where you get the inside scoop on the steps action takers and decision makers take to align their purpose to their principles and achieve their goals in business and life. We focus on the mantra, no labels, no limits, no excuses. And now, without further ado, please welcome your commanding coach with plenty of chutzpah and heart, Sarah Box. Hey there, this is Sarah, your host of the No Labels, No Limits podcast, a podcast all about shedding our limiting labels and beliefs so that we can live our dreams and shine our lights in the world. This week, we are joined by Stephanie Cook, who says it's never too late to start living your dream. And before you think this is just a motto, it is not. Stephanie actually lives this. She left a 25-year career to start over. Now, that's pretty impressive by itself. But consider this, she did it the day before the pandemic started and we all started going into shutdown. So that's one brave move forward. But she says the Enneagram has given her the language and the courage to live on purpose, with purpose, and for purpose. So just two years, just coming up on two years after leaving her career, um, Stephanie is really a successful Enneagram life coach, speaker, and creator of the On Purpose on coaching business where she helps others to improve relationships and to discover intentional, abundant living. And this is a fun fact I learned about her most recently and enjoyed an episode just this morning. She is the host of the What's Your Story podcast, and she has a great co-host, Hannah Conway. So with that, as a short introduction, let's welcome our guest, Stephanie Cook. Hi, Stephanie. Hello, thank you for having me. Well, I've been looking forward to this. Um, And folks, as I was telling Stephanie before this morning, I was getting going and I love finding out other women who have podcasts and I try to listen to them before I interview um, because it just makes me feel more connected. But she interviewed uh, author of a book that I read recently. So I'm going to come back towards the end of this interview and we'll talk about the podcast. But today we're going to plumb the depths of Stephanie's brain and experience about the Enneagram because she has quite a bit to share on that topic. Um, So Stephanie, as most of my guests know, I start by asking a variation of this question, and that is whether there's something that you do every day that keeps you living true to your own purpose and calling. Well, absolutely. I do start my day every morning. I'm fortunate because I do work from home now and my schedule is not as hectic as it used to be. So I do get to have that few minutes of quiet time every morning where I read scripture, do some journaling, have prayer time. And that is very important to me and how I get my day going every day. So I feel fortunate that I get to do that every morning. Has that always been something you could do? Not in the length that I am able to do it now. You know, now I get to spend time, slow down, meditate. I've always tried to do some form of that, but I can honestly say when I was working full time outside the home, my children were much smaller. Um, it was more like a five minute kind of a situation, whereas now I can usually commit about a half hour at least to it. And so um, I can say I get to do a little bit more in depth than I did many years ago. I think the I think that the more time I've had and have been able to similar to you like life circumstances change and you take advantage, but it feels so luxurious to go. Oh, I can read for a half an hour. I don't have to pop up and be out and in the car and driving somewhere. Yes, although I did joke just this week. I posted on my social media, as a matter of fact, on one of my Instagram stories that um, my daughter has moved back in with us. And um, we were empty nesters, but she's finishing up her master's, and so she's doing an externship for just one one semester locally. Um, and so with her came her dog. We call him our grand dog, our grand dog Remy, who's a little Shih Tzu. And so now when I'm trying to do my quiet time in the mornings, he sits at my feet and growls because he wants to play. He's a morning puppy for sure. And so I laughed and said, I feel like I've reverted back to when I had toddlers because he's he wants to interrupt that time every morning. Like, you know, pay attention to me. <laughs> He's just praying with you, little journal yeah. time, you know, I yeah. know, I love yeah. that. And it is funny. They do want your attention. They do. I cave every time. It's like, okay. <laughs> and when my dog was younger, he could actually hop on the bed. My husband would go, are you kidding? He's a huge dog. I go, mm. hey, it's good. He's here where he wants to be. I can do what I want to do. So absolutely. I was wondering if we could start by you sharing a bit of your journey. Um, You know, you have both a master's and a specialist in education. 
um, and educational psychology, which is a pretty deep field. Um, you are licensed as a school psychologist. So, and not only are you certified in both life coaching and Enneagram coaching, those are deep and useful topics and subjects, right? So how did you pivot from your 25 year career to doing what you're doing today? What was the motivation or point? Honestly, um, I call it, you know, it sounds cliche, but truly a God moment. Um, I loved my career. In fact, was incredibly content until the last probably two years. And all of a sudden, I began to experience discontentment. Um, I even say I felt like I probably fell into a season of depression. It was difficult for me to get up and go to work every day, very unlike anything that I had experienced previously. And so it was in, it was just very disheartening. And as we do as coaches, as someone with, you know, a degree in psychology, um, I tried all of the things to be resilient. So, you know, change your mindset, set, change your perspective, change your environment, change your circumstances, look for you know, good things, practice gratitude, all of those things that I would recommend to my clients. Um, and none of those things were working. And there was actually a moment where my husband, my husband knew that I was kind of struggling with this. And he feels like, and again, I do not use this lightly because um, I, I just, I feel like you can hear it and you can think, oh, that feels a little hokey or I've never heard that or that's never happened to me. But he will tell you, that he distinctly heard the voice of God in the shower one Saturday morning say, your wife needs to step into what I've called her to do. And so he actually woke me up on a Saturday morning and said, you, and he's, a, he's an Enneagram one. So those of you that are familiar with the Enneagram, you know, he, and he's an engineer. He's extremely logical. He's not a deep feeler. And so this was very out of character for him to even have this conversation with me. And he said, I feel like that I just got a word from the Lord. And he is saying, I need to encourage you and tell you it's time to move. Um, and I had been praying through the same thing. And so I actually went to, on a whim, um, a business boutique academy conference, which is Christy Wright. She worked for um, the Ramsey group for Dave Ramsey. And so she had a conference in our, near my hometown in Nashville. Um, every year. And so I thought, well, I'll go just here, kind of what it might be like to begin a business. I'm in my 25th year. In about five years, I'll retire. So maybe then I'll step into something different. And so I went to this conference um, and sat on the very back row, was not the least bit engaged, was literally, it was an information collecting experience for me. And I felt in that moment, no, this, this is the year you're, you're going to leave your career this year. And so that was in October and in March, as you shared, um, the day before the world kind of shut down for COVID, I, with trembling hands, wrote my letter of resignation um, and turned that in. And that was on a Thursday and on Friday, they, we did not go back to school. And so that was the year that I began coaching and kind of stepped away from that career. So now my husband likes to joke and say, people will say, so you retired. And he's like, oh no, she didn't retire. She just quit. <laughs> so That's kind of how that went. I really felt like that's what I was being called to do. What I think is so great about that story is that when you said your husband's this logical, like engineer guy, it's almost like if someone who was maybe more like you or more in like accepting of those kind of messages, it might not have struck you as hard as someone who's like going, he's not, this is serious stuff coming through my husband here. Right. So. Absolutely. So it, it was that just, you know, the combination of the two of us hearing yeah. the same thing at different times in different ways that solidified this was the next step. Not that that didn't make it, it was still terrifying. I'm not going to lie, it was terrifying. Um, you're but, stepping out of the known and what you're good at and all that stuff into the unknown. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it, has, it has taught me so much about risk-taking. I'm not a risky person. Um, and makes me wonder how many things in life I may have missed along the way because I was so fearful of taking a risk because it has been such a great transition for me. Can you share a bit about your type? And because when you say that I wasn't that kind of person, I bet there's someone listening going, I kind of feel like Stephanie. I wonder if I maybe am stumbling on something. So could you describe your type? And then I want to come back and talk more deeply around the Enneagram and the work you do. 
Absolutely. So I'm an Enneagram 2, the helper. I do have a three wing. So I do tend to um, be a go-getter. I, I go after things. Um, but at the same time, always a little leery about what will people think? And, you know, am I being too much? Am I being too pushy? Second guessing. Um, so all of my life, I have just kind of wanted to help. And in fact, it's funny, before I discovered the Enneagram, which we may talk about in just a little bit, but, um, you know, my mother would say, she just, she's always trying to help, like you always get yourself into trouble, into difficulties, because you're over helping, you're always trying to help. And so it's kind of been the joke, but that's probably what will be on my tombstone was she was only trying to help. Um, because that's what I've done. And so now that I have the language around the Enneagram, it's like, oh, there are other people. <laughs> there are other people that are like that as well. It's nice to be able to understand things about yourself and like joke about them like that and take it more lightheartedly than personally. You know, it's like, right. you're right. That's how I'm going to be. <laughs> and to even joke about your epitaph. Um, so uh -huh. how did you come to know the Enneagram, Stephanie? What was the was did you know that before you left your career was that after yes i had already begun to use the enneagram study the enneagram had kind of fallen in love with it um, my, you know as many of us when we first come across it my friends and family were sick of hearing about it everything that i could get my hands on i discovered it i believe through a podcast um, i think i was listening to um you know I'm, I'm very much a podcast listener as well as someone that has a podcast and so I was listening to some um, podcasts around Christian women's ministry, that kind of thing. And I think that I discovered it that way. And I, being someone that has a career or has a background in educational psychology, I've taken every one of those assessments out there. I mean, that's what I did. You know, I, I gave assessments to help with labeling. Um, and so it was one of those that I thought, oh, I've not heard of that one. I've done Myers-Briggs and Strength Finders and DISC and, you know, all, the, all of them. So it was just one more assessment that I could not wait to take and get my hands on. Um, but then when I discovered that it looks at motive, it looks at why, it looks at the, you know, not necessarily what we do, but why we do it, it made me even more excited about it as a tool for growth. So how has that actually applied on your own journey? We'll start with you first. So like when you think about the motivations behind a two, with the three wing, um, how has that helped you, what you've learned about yourself to progress? I think that for much of my life, I've been incredibly insecure, trying to appear as if I were secure. And my insecurities came from, you know, at Enneagram twos, we're, we're notoriously people pleasers. We are far too concerned about the perceptions and the opinions of others. We can almost shape shift sometimes because we're incredibly empathetic. So when we walk into a, a setting or a room, especially one that we're unfamiliar with, we gravitate toward probably the least enthusiastic person or the person in that room that may be giving off energy that for some reason we interpret as being needy or needing help or something's wrong. And so, like I said, I, I joke about it, but my whole life that's I would gravitate towards, um, you know, cases that I felt like I could help and as a result of that sometimes that worked out but more often than not there was some form of rejection or a boundary was set that I did not understand why that person wasn't you know appreciating that help that I was giving even though it was unsolicited um, and so there were so many relationship situations that I did not understand because I did not have the frame of the Enneagram and I didn't understand my role in what I was doing that was causing some of these things to happen. And so for me, it was an, an aha moment that just made me realize how few boundaries that I may have had in relationships. Now, granted, you know, I'm in my fifties. So I had, there was some maturity that had come along the way. I, I so wish I had had this tool in my twenties and thirties. Oh, the heartache that it could have saved or raising my children. Um, you know, goodness, but that was, that was just incredibly eye opening to me to recognize that that is a characteristic, that that is a motive. And then the word that continued to just haunt me. And I think, um, I don't know about that, you know, you, when you use the Enneagram, but with my clients, I always say there's usually some part that just kind of makes you a little queasy when you hear it, a little stick to your stomach. 
because, you know, especially as a two, so many folks were like, oh, you're kind and you're helpful and you're personable and we love to be around you. And I'm like, yes, but then let's talk about how we're manipulative and, you know, how we flatter to get what we want. And those were the things that really resonated with me was manipulation. That word just haunted me because I was aware of how often that that was what I was doing um, for the first time and really, you know, almost unconsciously um, that I used flattery and manipulation to win people over. And when you learned that, did you, and became more aware of it, did you notice yourself stopping and or reshaping your responses to things? Definitely. And like I said, I think being older in life has helped as well. Um, but now I, I recognize it. Can I say I never do it? Mm, I, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> I still tend to do that from time to time. But I catch myself in that moment and, and think, mm, no, uh, you know, what is it that you're really wanting? And why are you using, you know, this to try to get your way? So in answer to your question, I have noticed that about myself. And the piece about a five, right, is that we're stingy with our time, right? We hole up. We feel threatened, whatever. And I know that that has hurt relationships because people don't understand it. And I haven't expressed what I needed, right? But the other mm -hmm. thing that I realize is that bugs me because I don't intend to do that. And so I've now when I can feel it happening, and it's happened recently with a family member who just like out of the blue needed something. I had a full day scheduled and I started thinking, oh my God, what am I going to do? And I thought, just relax. Why don't you let the day unfold? Let's see what really happens. And yeah. let's just play it by ear and things can shift. And I started communicating that with clients and people that, you know, said, are we going to get together? I said, it depends. Please give yeah. me the grace. It depends. And everybody said, oh, sure. But, you know, I wouldn't have done that before. I would have just thought, OK, I, I have to compartmentalize. Right. Which is yeah. a strength. It's a great strength when there's things going on to just not get sucked up into the emotion um, and be able to think logically. But it doesn't feel good if you're in a a relationship where you want to connect with someone. So um, yeah, those weren't well, my interestingly, favorite parts. Interestingly enough, the greatest relationship that has been impacted is that of myself and my son, who is a five. And so as a five, especially, he's, he actually has his 26th birthday and just in, coming up in a couple of days. But especially as a teenager and through college, not knowing the Enneagram and not having language around that as a, a helper, and the five, you know, you all value independence so greatly. And so it was this constant just train wreck, honestly, of me inserting myself into his life, him pulling away and me feeling rejected. And so we, it was just a cycle. And so for both of us, again, to have language around. And so, um, you know, just to kind of chase a rabbit in that story that you just shared, we learned last Christmas, as a matter of fact, my son it, it said, you know, what is the expectation? Like, how long do you want me to at your house? What is it that we're going to do? Like, give me a parameter, give me an expectation and I will meet it. Otherwise, I may or may not show up. And so just something as simple as that. I totally get your kid. <laughs> yes, that has improved our relationship yeah. so much because I get that that's not a rejection or an indication of how much he loves me. That's him conserving that energy being stingy with that time. And I mean, that child is a go getter. Like he owns his own business and he sets goals and meets them, but you don't interrupt, you know, in fact, we laugh now because with the new iPhone update, you can turn on, do not disturb your, you don't get silence your notifications. And so just this past weekend, I said, we're going to have, a, have to have a conversation about this silence notifications because your mother when she needs you, she needs you. <laughs> Sorry, Stephanie, that doesn't work. So my husband does that too. He goes, did you get my text? I said, I was in the middle of an interview. And I'm, and I said, no, I will turn my phone on. And, you know, because they're silent. I get them. I just don't look at them. I go, I can't do that. Pop in and out. I don't know how people do that because it takes me a long time to get back in. And so he goes, okay, but we at least flip your phone over every hour and see if there's something going on. Yes, it just yeah, but it I, didn't occur to me, Stephanie, that it makes other people uncomfortable. I just figured, isn't that interesting? I see. I love. I love that so much that, and it wouldn't have occurred to me to ever behave in the way that he behaves. Like that would. It felt rude 
you know, to be honest, it was, from my perspective, I'm like, that's so rude. From his perspective, it's like, that makes perfect sense. So, yeah. But I say, I he, tell he your son, I, I totally get him. Well, he's in a new relationship and she's an Enneagram too. And I'm just like, oh Lord, let's let this work out because that could be fun. Well, he may come to you for a little bit of advice. Okay, mom, how do I reel this in? Or not, we'll see. He may just research it on his own. Um, yeah. So that's hilarious, but it is funny. And, you know, thinking it'd be great to have known these younger, I'm not sure without life experience and a few bruises, I would have known the importance of using it at quite the level that I do now. Mm -hmm. You know, right. I don't I don't know that I would have valued it in quite the same way. And mm -hmm. um, like you, I have taken all those assessments. But you're right. They don't tell me the why behind the what or the how. Um, and I can do how and I can do what all day long. I'm strategic. But knowing the why. It's a game changer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So when you work with folks, Stephanie, who do you typically work with? Do you have a typical type of client age range or what or a favorite oh that's hard um the favorite part <laughs> I figured I, is I it too that was almost unfair to ask I but. love them all <laughs> it's like look I think do you have a favorite child no I love them all um most of my clients are women um it's interesting because I am part of um the year Enneagram coach becoming an Enneagram coach network and so now I'm being kind of solicited from the nation, like around the nation. And I was sharing um, just, just this week that it's the folks that tend to gravitate are either female twos or females that have come from a field of education. And so I'm finding that a lot of my clients are very similar to me. And so I enjoy that in some regards and other, it's like, it's almost too close sometimes. Um, I also have, um, a couple of couples <laughs> that I am really enjoying working with as well. And um, that dynamic is fun for me to kind of try to help navigate some of those communication difficulties. So, but I, I love coaching in general. I love all of it. Well, I can see that. I can feel it, you know? Um, well, thank you. When you're working with couples, what is one of the aha moments that you see frequently when you're having couples work together and could you just share a little bit with the audience about like what a process would look like in case someone's saying yeah i'd like to do this with my partner yeah so for the ones that i have worked with we spent several weeks narrowing down to make sure we kind of had their numbers right or you know at least in the same ballpark because you and i know there's there are some numbers that are more similar than others so we could easily throw a few out and then there are some that are commonly mistyped. And then depending on if you're focused, you know, if you're, you're functioning in more of a stress path or a growth path, they can look different ways. And so we'll spend several weeks just walking through the numbers. Um, and then just using a lot of resources around communication. So it kind of depends. Um, one particular couple that I'm working with, they have difficulty around finances. But when we really started drilling down, it finances are what they thought they struggled with, but it's always communication. And so, you know, with another couple, they think, you know, they struggle around a different area, but when we begin to really dig in, it's always communication. It's communication style, conflict triggers. Those are the types of things that we work on. Language, like how can you say the same thing? So for example, just what we, you and I were talking about, how can as a five, can I communicate? My energy is depleted. I have no more energy for you in a kind way that doesn't feel offensive, you know? So one of my couples, she's an eight and he's a five. And so he withdraws and she gets more aggressive as she is passionate about something. So if something comes onto their radar that she's incredibly passionate about because she loves him and because she wants the family to, you know, to grow or experience something, she gets stronger. And when she gets stronger, it makes him pull back even more because it's that, you know, inserting her um, control and him wanting more independence. And so it's a dance that they do. And so just walking through different scenarios over time, and we've been together several weeks at this point, but walking through those scenarios, they're beginning to see how to maybe break that cycle and communicate a little better. Communication, communication, communication. And as Absolutely. uncomfortable as it can be sometimes, it really is the, it is the golden key. Yeah. And awareness. I think, you know, oh, I yeah. say a lot of awareness is key. 
And so when they have that light bulb moment of, oh, <laughs> oh, that's oh, when that's I know, what oh, it is. yeah, I'm like, okay, now we're on to something. And so for this particular couple, when they realized this is really not about money, it was like, mm, now we're on to something. Well, and I remember thinking that too, like, because I have just different styles of money. I used to do our budgeting because I just was that way, right? I always did before we mm -hmm. got married. And then when I went back for my master's, like I'm working full time, I'm doing school online, remote at night, and I'm trying to keep up with our budget. My husband goes, you want me to take that over for you? And there my thing, like my stomach clenched and I'm going, no, I don't. I want control. I want mm -hmm. to feel safe. So I'm a five. I want to feel secure. I didn't, mm -hmm. it's not, I didn't trust him. I just want to feel secure. If I do it myself, I feel secure. But then mm -hmm. there's a part of me thinking you're sinking, Sarah, if you want your grades to be good, which I want more than feeling secure, give mm -hmm. it up. He said, I'm happy to do it, honey. And I have one caveat. You cannot tell me how to do it. And I, I almost backtracked. But I'm thinking, <laughs> right? Oh, well, then I'm out. <laughs> right. Almost, yeah. almost, right? Yeah. And, but here's the irony of it. He's way better at it than I was. He does it totally different, but mm -hmm. he knows exactly what's happening. And he'll come and say, hey, is this legit? And I'm thinking, I don't even know what you're talking about. He goes, look, this charge. And I'm thinking, th and that was like 10, 15 years ago, Stephanie. I never took yeah. it back. I have no intention of taking that back. Isn't but, that awesome? Yeah. But honestly, I thought it was like we didn't see things the same way until I got mm -hmm. to the fact like I was insecure about it. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I think that whole being able to go, what, what's at issue here is really powerful. Yes. So how has that um, for your families, you know, and within your own family, you talked about your son, your relationship, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering like with your, your, your parents, your in-laws, how you've seen that kind of play out. Are they all on the Enneagram train with you? Well, interestingly enough, <laughs> so for my daughter's 21st birthday, and we all got together and we're, we're close to we're close to Nashville. So Gatlinburg is a fun spot for us to do a weekend kind of thing. And so we went to the mountains and there was a rainy day in the mountains. And we were all kind of sitting around the cabin with nothing to do. And I had just discovered the road back to you. And so which is, you know, the book by Ian Cron and Suzanne Stabile. And I said, oh, I know it will be fun. And so in that book. There are several pages of what it's like to be a whatever the number is. And there's probably 15 or 20 statements on each of those pages that just describe that Enneagram type. And so we spent the afternoon reading through what it's like to be a and we all kind of discovered. Uh, I knew already because I, I was already into it, but everyone discovered their Enneagram type. And it has been the most fun and the most eye-opening for my extended family. So this was my mom, my dad, my brother and sister-in-law, her two children, my two children, my husband and myself. So there are 10 of us. And we spend a lot of time together vacationing and doing things. And so and to make a very long story short, I am the only one in the whole family that comes out of the feeling triad. So I'm a two, wow. so two, threes and fours. So everyone else is either a gut triad or a head triad. And so they, I'll joke and say they have no feelings, but that's not true. But in my perception, I was always the one that would leave these family gatherings with my feelings hurt, or I would dwell on some conversation and replay it. And how could that have gone differently? And just felt like I never got to make decisions. Like, you know, other people were like, this is where we're going to eat, or this is where we're going to vacation. And and, you know, my input was never heard, would feel sorry for myself. I had all these things that were going on. And so now when I began to kind of explore, oh, you're the feeler and no one else is. So it's a family full of ones and eights and fives. My daughter, we think is a three. At the time, she was kind of functioning more like a nine because she was right in the middle of college and stayed stressed all the time. And, and so when we began to look at that now, when they're strong and assertive, even aggressive sometimes. My brother's a very strong Enneagram 8. Um, now it doesn't hurt my feelings anymore because I'm like, oh. And now they say, this is what we want to do, but what do you want to do? Because they recognize that I'm not going to insert myself. I'm not going to, you know, share my opinion right off the bat. And so it has been really, really fun for us. So that's been probably three years ago. And we would all say, 
it has been so helpful to us as, a, as an extended family unit. I'm wondering why we don't have those conversations more. Yeah. 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 Well, and again, in their defense, you know, as you've shared, coming through graduate school, and even my husband, bless his heart. So he and I were dating when I started graduate school. And so you have to, as a student, you, you gather your family to take all the assessments. They're your guinea pigs, right? So every theory that you think, you know, when you first discover um, the DSM, everybody has mental illness. And so all your family <laughs> gets that assigned to them. So, I mean, all of those things. So in their defense, they have gone through that journey with me for many, many years. My husband and I have been married 31 years. And so when I pulled out a brand new tool, there were lots of moans and groans and eye rolls. <laughs> So, um, and I get it. I get it. I do too. But I think like even just being curious about one another um, in general, in society, in our community and stuff, if we could come with that, like, oh, let's see where we resonate here versus having mm -hmm. to figure something out. Like, let's just be people together and see yeah. what we see. I just think yeah. how, I, I wonder how powerful that would be in changing conversation. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, but through 2020 specifically, um, I, and I'm on social media probably more than I should be, but I found myself reading conversations and making assumptions about Enneagram numbers based on how people were responding and what they were saying. <laughs> and I thought, oh, if we only had that tool and could all communicate from that framework. I know. And I, I do read, I'm thinking, what's really going on here that this is coming out of someone's mouth? Like, what, what is the pain or what is this happening here? And because I know, mm -hmm. and you know, from personal experience, people show up one way, but when you get to know them, you get to actually know their heart. Right. You know, right. and so the gruff exterior or whatever, like the facade, or you look at them and you discount them because they're not like you, mm -hmm. um, but you listen to them and experience them, you're thinking, oh my gosh, what a great being. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Kind of makes me want to cry. Okay. Um, but I don't want to cry because I'm not in that triad. So <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay. Come on over. <laughs> I do have deep feelings, but I just don't like to sink into them um, with a group. Um, but let me ask you a, a question here. Uh, what lights you up most about your Enneagram work so far? Oh, wow. Well, I mean, I'm a helper, so <laughs> just being able, anytime anyone says that was so helpful, that's, that is like, you know, pouring gasoline on my fire. I, I love that. Perfect. Okay. Come with me and let's pivot briefly and talk about your podcast. Will you share the um, idea that got you thinking and sparked the creation of your podcast and what your mission for the podcast is basically? Oh, I'd love to. So it's called What's Your Story with Hannah and Stephanie. Hannah Conway is my co-host, like you shared. Um, and really, we she's an Enneagram too. <laughs> and we just love stories and we love people. And so we would talk about how we were just inquisitive and curious and we would meet women doing different things. She's she's the women's ministry director for our local church. And she actually has a background in education too. And so we were just constantly talking about just fascinating people and we would love to share this story or this story or this story. And so one day I said, let's start a podcast. And she said, let's do it. And so we set a, an iPhone in between us and, and hit record. And that's kind of how we started. But we really wanted to share. We said we want to share the um, extraordinary stories of ordinary people so that God gets the glory for what he's doing in their lives. And so we just truly believe, um, and I think you do as well. We've talked just a minute before we started recording that there are amazing stories all around us. And just because someone does not have a platform that's, that's ginormous or um, that's, you know, popular in the public eye doesn't mean that their story is any less incredible. And so we started asking our friends on and friends of friends, and we are 105 episodes in. And every week, she and I just, as soon as we're finished, we, we giggle and we say, that's one more amazing story. Like, we're just not tired of hearing stories. Doesn't it just fill you up? It does. And just yeah. the, something small in every single situation just, yeah, just resonates. And, and they stick with me, you know. I know. Well, first of all, congratulations on making it to 100. Right. Thank when you. you first start out, you're wondering like, hmm, 
And then all of a sudden you're at 100, you're going, hmm, that came quick. So, and it sounds like just listening to the two of you interact that you have a good time doing this. Oh, well, thank you. We do. We, we do. She's, she's a, a much younger version of me. <laughs> so I have more life experience, but it's funny how we see things through the same lens with both being an Enneagram too often. Yeah. I, w- I actually think when I feel your energy, not to get too woo-woo on you, but um, you feel very much on par with one another, very oh, much well, in thank sync. You. So thank you for saying so. Yeah, I wouldn't have been able to like if someone says, "Give me ages," I'm thinking, I don't know, they're about the same age. <laughs> Maybe I'm just childish and immature. <laughs> I don't know. I'm fine with that too. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure I would say that, but um, but I do know that when I poked around on your website, you have some great freebie freebies for our listeners. Can you share what those are? I do. Well, actually, I have just published a devotional um, on my website and it's that it's not probably not going to be available because I think I'm going to self-publish that. So that's there right this moment, but I don't know how long that's going to be there. Um, And I do have some um, a free assessment. You can take a free Enneagram assessment. So that's available there. So if you don't know what your Enneagram type is and you're interested in that, you can check that out. Um, I do have a blog that I write as well. So there's all that free content is there. So there's things like that. Super. I kind of always changing that. So I think that's maybe why that, that question stumped me just a little bit, because honestly, I'm like, what's there right this moment? Because I do change that quite a bit. I was going to, I saw the free devotional and I thought, "Hmm, Mm -hmm. I wonder if that's going to be an ongoing thing. Yeah. So that was for the month of February. Yeah. Yeah. That was for the month of February. So actually February 1st is the last day that's available. So there you go, folks. Today's the last day and this won't be published today. So you're already out of the of the devotional, but go back and check her website. And I and I'm being really serious here. Check out the website. It's a great website, Stephanie. It feels very inviting. Um, I think people can hear in your voice and your energy what working with you would be like. Um, And, you know, you bring so much to the table. Oh, thank you so much for saying that. I so, enjoy what I'm doing. I feel blessed. It shows. It shows. And we'll put in your links. So anybody listening to this who's going, what, where do I get it? How do you spell Stephanie? Where is the stuff? It's in the show notes. We'll have all the hyperlinks there. So don't worry about it. Just enjoy Stephanie. Um, and if you like this podcast and you know someone who's going to get some great info from Stephanie, please share it. Share it with whomever you want, because we want to get the word about Stephanie out there because i know you're changing lives stephanie oh well thank you and you are as well so i appreciate you giving us the opportunity to, to share our stories with you i love stories too <laughs> thanks so much you've been listening to the no labels no limits podcast with best-selling author change agent and strategic vision coach sarah box you can grab the show notes and find out how to work with Sarah at sarahbox.com forward slash no labels, no limits podcast. We'd love this podcast to reach as many people as possible. So please remember to rate, leave a five star review, and share the podcast with someone you think would get value from this conversation. Until next time, keep taking those daily action steps to align your purpose to your principles and achieve your goals in business and life.